Um, and now returning to our program, uh, thank you again to the treasurer, but um, now we're going to get a little more into the weeds on corporate taxes. And so have a fantastic panel in store for you to um, talk about different aspects of corporate taxation and um, what New Jersey is doing right, what New Jersey could be doing better in the future. Um, and so I have four great panelists here. Um, Aaron Binder, our Deputy State Treasurer. Um, Audrey Lane, Policy Director from Garden State Initiative. Michael Pusick is the Senior Manager in Indirect Tax Group uh, from EY. And David Shipley, uh, Co-Chair of State and Local Tax Group at Stevens and Lee. Uh, so thank you to the four of you. And again, their bios are, you can look at the QR code on the agenda and, and learn more about all of them. And they are all very, very impressive people, so I encourage you to do that. But, um, but wanted to make sure we have uh, plenty of time to talk taxes. Um, and I think sometimes we hear in New Jersey about um, affordability and competitiveness. And I think sometimes we don't spend as much time talking about the corporate side of that equation as we do talking about the um, other parts of just, is it affordable for that, that family, that mom and dad? And it's just as important, and I think we're going to hear that with our um, panel today. Um, wanted to start with uh, Deputy Treasurer Binder. And um, we heard from the Treasurer about the positives in the state budget. Um, and specifically, um, she finished up, I think appropriately so, with the two corporate initiatives that were in the state budget. Um, can you talk about the Murphy administration's plans to try to make us more competitive in that corporate tax world um, and um, anything else in the budget that you want to highlight? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, again, my name is Aaron Binder, and Deputy State Treasurer. Really uh, pleased to be here to participate in the panel. Um, I'll start by just talk, as Chris mentioned, just talk a little bit about a couple of the um, corporate tax issues and some of the things the Murphy administration is doing around corporate tax policy. Um, and start with a couple of the things that the Treasurer mentioned. First, the uh, CBT surcharge. Uh, when the Governor announced back in, I think, January that um, really affirming his support for allowing the surcharge to expire, um, the comment he made was, a deal is a deal. And, you know, the administration is committed to allowing the surcharge to expire. Um, in February, he presented his budget, and as the Treasurer went through in great detail, um, you know, that budget reflects that commitment. The surcharge revenue is not in the budget. Um, the budget has a structural balance and approximately a $10 billion projected surplus without the surcharge revenue in the budget. So um, he affirmed that commitment. I think, you know, the perspective for the administration is, you know, there is agreement that, you know, the, the intent is to make New Jersey more competitive. Even after the expiration of the surcharge, the New Jersey's corporate tax rate is going to be higher than most states. Um, we'll still be in the top five. However, um, you know, for our regional competitive competitor states, you know, it puts us much more in line with those states. Um, and as you know, like competitiveness, you can't be taken in a vacuum just with tax rates. And we can maybe talk a little bit about the, more about that in the panel. Um, but there's a lot of other factors as well. But but just specifically to tax rates, you know, this will make us more competitive. Um, I think it's you know worth mentioning that you know because of the strength of the budget, because of some of the fiscal restraints and the um, the, some of the things the Murphy administration has done to put the budget in this kind of condition, it allows for this to continue with, you know, the surcharge to expire and, and that commitment to be continued without, you know, blowing a hole in the budget as, you know, has been discussed. And I think there, you know, some will argue that there is going to be a return from the economic activity associated with this. And we would agree, you know, there is going to be some return on that. Um, the timing is the issue, you know, in terms of a budget process. So. The budget's the strength of the budget puts us in a position where the surcharge, you know, is going to expire. Um, the other piece I just want to mention is the CBT reform bill, and I know we touched on that a little bit. Um, and Mike had mentioned, um, you know, really the the work of the Division of Taxation and John Fakara and Alan Klein. Um, I would also like to just, you know, mention uh, Chris, BIA, Mike. Um, I know members of this panel. Like a lot of people, a lot of hard work went into that. That working on that group. Um, a really inc incredible effort to get it to that point. Um, we went in with the goal, of the administration, of you know, let's make New Jersey more competitive. Let's improve tax compliance. Let's let's make it easier to administer the tax code. Um, and I think that bill, which we're going to talk about in a little more detail on this panel, also, you know, achieved a lot of those goals. And it, you know, it's not a perfect bill. And I think some there are some pieces that people, some groups, will not particularly support. But that's probably ultimately what makes it a pretty good bill because you know there's something that everybody doesn't like in that bill, which generally means it's probably a pretty good bill. So, um, <laughs> no, I, <laughs> no I, I think that's it's a good government sign that I think um, and and 
talking about that. I, I think when Treasury approached BIA and the business community, they said there's things in this bill that we've been wanting and you're not going to like. There's things that we know you've been asking for that we don't love. Let's figure out how to find, make it a win-win and negotiate something. And that, that's the way government should work, and I appreciate um, you and Treasury, Treasury Moyo, the Murphy administration, allowing that to happen. So thank you. Sure. Yeah, you really, I mean, did a great job, as I think somebody had said, herding cats, cats for it, <laughs> because, you know, it's, just, it's not an easy process, and we really reached a bill that was close to consensus, and, you know, I think that's a credit to everyone involved in that process. Um, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about specifics in the bill. Um, certainly the guilty pieces, you know, will make us more competitive. A lot of it will. So with that, I'll turn it back to the rest of the panel. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, Aaron mentioned the rate reduction, and, um, and I think Audrey, Garden State Initiative, you've been um, very, very involved in the recent research that Garden State Initiative put out that talked about um, the importance of the corporate tax rate in competitiveness and um, where our rate is right now, where it's going to be, and what other states have done and, and what things we can learn from that. So I want to turn it over to you, talk about your report, and talk about um, your thoughts on that rate reduction and um, maybe where we should go after that. Terrific. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me today. Um, and for those of you who really would like to get in the weeds on corporate tax reform, there's a 40-page report on our website um, that can, um, you know, keep you up at night if you want. <laughs> um, but we're at GardenStateInitiative.org. Um, it's pretty easy to find. Um, so, so, Chris, to your point, um, a lot of states have taken steps over the past 10 years um, to, to make some changes. Four that we highlighted in particular in our report are Iowa, Indiana, North Carolina, and we're certainly keeping an eye on Pennsylvania. Um, Iowa in 2022 passed corporate tax reform. Um, they, were, they were actually one of the offenders, much like New Jersey, in the, in the bottom five. Um, they had a high 9% corporate tax rate. And, and just to put this all in perspective, they were at 9%. New Jersey is the highest corporate tax rate in the country at 11.5% right now. Um, I'm going to say that again. We are the highest corporate tax rate at 11.5%. Even if this um, surcharge sunsets, we will be the fourth highest. Um, so, so we're talking about baby steps here. Um, so Iowa in 2022 had a 9% rate, and they have, they're moving toward a single rate of 5.5% um, over time. And I want to say that all of the states I'm going to mention put up guardrails. Um, and what I be, mean by that, if... Um, their revenue wasn't hitting certain marks. The reduction in the rate was, was not enacted. So it was a really smart policy move, and, and our research shows that it was effective. Indiana in 2014 had an 8.5% rate. In 2016, they moved down to 6.25%. And in 2022, down to 4.9%. So you'll see this stair step is a common... Um, method that other states have used effectively. North Carolina in 2013, and, and we love North Carolina. <laughs> in 2013, um, they had a 6.99% um, corporate tax rate, which doesn't sound too bad. Um, but they really made a multifaceted um, effort to, to revamp their whole tax structure. And it didn't occur in a vacuum. Um, but they went down to 5% in 2015. Um, and then um, in 2017, it was 3%. And by 2030, they're working toward a 0% corporate tax rate. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about that later, about that concept of a 0% corporate tax rate. Um, in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania took the opportunity with a surplus in, in their um, state coffers, which might sound familiar to those who are listening. They have a surplus, and what they did was they enacted corporate tax rate. That's what they felt was a priority, and they did that in a bipartisan manner. And in 2023, um, they are going to. They have made steps to go from 8.99 percent corporate tax rate down to 4.99. So a lot of work being done. I'm also going to say that this year in 2023, 38 states in the union. Um, enacted corporate tax changes of significance. New Jersey was not one of them. But we're going to catch up this year. 
we're gonna catch up this year. Um, and, and, and I do wanna end on a positive note. It's not like me, Chris, so thank you for calling me out on that. It's not like <laughs> me to end on a negative note. Um, we were thrilled to hear the governor um, make a concerted effort to mention the sunsetting of the corporate tax rate. Um, it, it, it's, it's a first step and uh, you know, at Garden State Initiative, it was, it was a great first step. To, to add, add something there, I mean, I think there may still be some work to do, especially in the area of you know, small businesses where you have the income flowing through to an individual being taxed at the gross income tax rates. And those rates affect businesses as much as the corporate tax rate when you're dealing with small businesses, which we know, you know very much form the backbone of a lot of New Jersey's economy. Absolutely. I had the opportunity to talk to NFIB yesterday about small businesses and how they feel uh, even changes to the corporate tax rate will have an ancillary effect um, just due to the business community and the smaller businesses that support corporations. So it's not just 2,500 corporations that are paying this corporate tax. It's all of the other ancillary um, businesses that, that, that feed off of it. So thank you for bringing that up as well. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, David. Um, so obviously, Aaron touched upon two things. There's the rate, and there's also the administration, the, the policies behind the rate. And I think both of them play an important part of that affordability and competitiveness dialogue that we've been having. Um, Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about that, that, that bill, the A5323, S3737, and its impact on um, some of the, the, the features, the weeds of corporate taxation? Um, I know, like the, the the benefits, the uh, clarity, the um, how it treats everybody. Um, can you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll I'll keep it to the Cliff's Notes version because there's so much in here that I think we could take the rest of the day talking about it. But um, you know, when when we're talking about the the bill that Dave and I are going to really get into the weeds on, um, th this was a concerted effort um, between industry the division, right, it's, it has broad-based sponsorship. And I think that this bill really does a lot to make us more competitive. It at least uh, takes out a lot of features that made us an outlier, uh, not only nationally, but more importantly, regionally. Um, you know, and I'm gonna hand it over to Dave, but one of the most important aspects of this bill really is to reform the treatment of uh, global uh, intangible low tax income or guilty. Um, right now, New Jersey has it in the base, but as Dave's going to explain, there, there's going to be a very significant change to this. So yeah, I, I mean, I think let, let's let's start really with explaining what guilty is because everyone views this as this is a very complicated tax concept, and there are some policy groups that I don't think understand what it is, and that's sort of giving their objections to this change. Prior to the implementation of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act federally, corporations in the U.S. would only be taxed on income earned by foreign subsidiaries when it was distributed as a dividend. So what do you do to avoid tax? You don't distribute a dividend. And so these foreign subsidiaries would just build up retained earnings. There'd be no dividend coming back to the United States. There'd be no U.S. tax. Guilty was part of a two-pronged solution. The first prong was you know, effective for 2017, which said we're going to tax sort of historical earnings that weren't distributed. But guilty sort of is a proxy for a dividend. This is what we think should be being taxed in the US as a dividend. And New Jersey, originally, the, the way their tax is set up, they were an outlier among states. Most states said this is going to be taxed just like a dividend and taxed it that way. And I think that's the key provision of this bill. And I think one of the things that you know, corporations are very happy about with this bill is that the guilty fix is actually a fix. They are now treating it as a dividend and subjecting it to tax in the same manner. And I think that's consistent from a policy perspective as to what guilty income really represents, what guilty income was set up to, uh, the problem is set up to address. And people just saying, hey, this is like any other income, really don't understand what guilty is. I mean, and if you think about it, this is income earned 
not just outside New Jersey, outside the United States that's coming back to a parent company in New Jersey. And you know, having a tax on guilty is really taxing companies you know, that are headquartered companies that own foreign subsidies, the exact companies we want to be in New Jersey. So I think this is a, a good fix. And those who are objecting to it, I think, have not the best understanding of why, what guilty actually is about. No. Thank you, David. Um, and David, also um, another key feature that is a reason why business organizations like BIA and State Chamber are happy to support this bill is the net operating loss changes in the bill. And could you talk a little bit about that and it's also how that fits within something else and, and maybe uh, Mike or David want to, like the Joyce vs. Finnegan change. A lot of people have heard these names. Um, is it actually a real person? Where do the names come from? <laughs> and, and who are these Joyce and Finnegan people? But and what do they have to do with, with how you apportion corporate taxes? But then why the state's making this change and then why some of the other changes fit within that? Right. So, so Joyce and Finnegan is not a comedy duo, <laughs> um, but are two California State Board of Equalization cases. So California was one of the first states to enact unitary combined reporting. And when they enacted it, They've, since the years they've had it, they've flipped back between these two positions. Joyce basically says, you have a group of companies, and we're going to take the income of that group and, and break it up among each company. And then each company is going to compute their separate tax. And so what that does is that eliminates any tax avoidance strategies or things like that, because the income is split among the entities based on their business activity. Under Finnegan, the I'm sorry, that, that would, yeah, so under Finnegan, Joyce, Joyce is separate. Under Finnegan, uh, really the group is treated as a single taxpayer. And all of the income's combined and is apportioned by all the apportionment factors of the group. And it's a policy change of how you tax it. And again, we can argue whether one is better than the other. We can argue about the, the implications of that. But it's truly just a policy decision whether to tax one or the other. Sure. Now, you know, speaking to Joyce and Finnegan, really this is um, New Jersey's continuing movement to treat combined groups of companies that are engaged in what's known as a unitary business as a single taxpayer. Um, you know, to, to Dave's point, under Joyce, you would determine whether you would apportion income based on each individual constituent company's uh, presence in New Jersey or their nexus, right? New Jersey began that, right, they, they had a Finnegan concept for one of the methods by which you would combine your companies and file together. Now, now that's going, you know, that's going away. And it really is comprehensive, right? You know, we, Chris, you had mentioned NOLs. NOLs, that, that's something that is a very valuable attribute for a company, right? You incur a loss in one year, you can use it in a subsequent year. That's a very valuable thing to have. Um, originally, New Jersey's policy was that if you had a separate company that incurred a net operating loss, it could only use it against its share of combined income, right? It, right. It, and these were losses correct. incurred prior to the shift of combined reporting. Exactly, yeah. right. And, and, and then there were you know, all kinds of rules that were put in place about when you can share and not share um, you know, losses that were accumulated even in combination. Uh, now, New Jersey is shifting to those losses being used on a purely group basis. And, and that is an important innovation uh, for the state. And again, it, it really shows that policy dynamic for New Jersey saying, look, we were a separate company state historically. Now we're really going all in on combination. And their, their concept of what, combine, uh, what groups are combinable you know, that, that New Jersey has essentially said that to the extent the Constitution lets us combine you, we're going to do it, right? So, you know, I, I, I see the future of New Jersey really embracing that concept and saying that, um, you know, companies together that are doing business as a cohesive unit are going to be taxed that way. Yeah. And, and again, kudos to, to Aaron and the administration for not just picking and choosing when you're going to apply the shift from Joyce to Finnegan saying, hey, we're going to apply it only when it helps us. You know, they were consistent from a policy perspective, which is appreciated, that you know, you're, you're being genuine, you're being consistent. Yeah, and, and that is an important point, right? It's, it, it, you know, it's not necessarily a revenue raiser. Every, everybody thought originally, well, the shift to combined reporting, this is really just, just to raise revenues. It's, it's not. It's a, it's a conceptual shift, which in certain instances is not going to raise revenue. In fact, uh, certain states like Maryland have explored that, and they actually historically had 
um, data gathering requirements to evaluate whether or not combination was worthwhile. And it was determined that it wasn't, right? You still have a number of states regionally that are not combined filing states, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania being the prominent among them. Um, so again, th this really is just rethinking the way that New Jersey wants to tax corporations, um, but it's not necessarily going to be a revenue raiser. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the area where there is revenue is we said, you know, under Joyce, each entity is separately taxed. Each entity's taxability, or what we call in the tax word, nexus to being taxed, was separately determined too. So you could have two entities of the group that are subject to tax, and one could be uh, not subject to tax either based on federal law or otherwise. When you shift to Finnegan, each member of the group is taxed because, again, the group's looked at as a single taxpayer. So I think that that's where the revenue comes in. There's sort of an offset there about, hey, you're able to use these prior net operating losses against any entity in the group. And there's a couple other minor changes in there that you know, go both ways on that. So it, again, it, it's consistent. It's a give and take, which a lot of this, a lot of the draft legislation actually is. No, and I think um, from the pro innovation side, and we talked about supporting the innovation economy and the budget, and Murphy administration has done a lot for there. But I think net operating losses and innovation go hand in hand a lot of times because those startup companies, those companies invested in a lot of R and D, a lot of capital, often there's losses and there's years where they're not doing as well. And having a more robust NOL policy, I think, will help that and help our innovation ecosystem. I um, want to um, jump back to um, Audrey and Aaron and talking a little about the rates. And I know Aaron referenced the, um, uh, and, and Audrey both, that, that there's this potential, the critics out there, oh, oh there, there could be this hole in the budget. And, um, and I guess two things, number one for Aaron and then for Audrey, but um, as the treasurer laid out, there's a lot of fiscally responsible initiatives in this budget that I think Governor Murphy's continued and even some new things. Um, and I, I like to say, I think those fiscally responsible initiatives make it easier to do something like lower that rate as, as you laid out. Can you go through some of those and, and explain why that puts us in a good financial footing and why that'll be easier to have a more competitive um, tax system going forward because of them? Sure, thanks Chris. Um, you know, the first one that I know the treasurer mentioned that I mentioned also was the, the fact that we have a $10 billion surplus or a projected $10 billion surplus. Um, there's clearly a lot of uncertainty around revenue just generally and the economy. Um, so that puts us in a position to, you know, to be able to withstand whatever un unexpected um, surprises await, which we know are, are coming at some point. Um, that surplus is actually below the national average as a percentage um, for other first states, uh, but it's also I think about 11 times the surplus that um, the administration inherited when uh, it first took over. So um, it definitely puts us in a better position to withstand whatever is coming. Um, the budget has a, for the first time really, I've been doing state budgets for a, a while now, and this is the first time we've ever had a budget proposal with a structural balance. So recurring revenue exceeds recurring expenses in this proposal. And as long as I can remember, that has never happened, while also meeting all, all the commitments in the budget. Um, which means, you know, structurally balanced means going forward, we should be able to pay our bills. You know, we should have the money on a recurring basis to meet our expenses, which is just a really critical point. Um, the administration has continued to pay down debt. Uh, there's 2.35 billion proposed to go into this uh, debt account to reduce the amount of debt and to avoid future debt which is more than 11 billion now over these last three budgets. Um, and what that means is the total uh, bonded debt, which has been a big problem for the state, uh, is actually lower than it's been in well over a decade. So the, the reliance on debt has really um, decreased. Uh, and the last thing I'll mention is the pension payment. Um, this is the third year in a row the state has made the full pension payment, which is approximately $7 billion. Um, since 1995, this administration will now have put in over 73%, I believe, of all pension contributions that have been made into the pension system. So just in these this six budgets, 73% of all the pension contributions since 1995. So, you know, for years, the pension system went neglected, which is really, you know, sort of a shadow borrowing exercise when you're not paying down the pension liability, um, which is a big problem. And so a lot of these things have been addressed, a lot of work to do still, as we, you know, the treasurer mentioned, but it definitely just puts the budget into a place where there isn't the same level of desperation that there had been in the past, where, you know, we're looking for every possible solution to balance the budget. 
it's at a point now where you know it is in a reasonably good position where we can make good decisions like allowing a surcharge, CBT surcharge to expire. Um, and just one, one other point I'd like to make just on the tax rate, and I know you know as we compare to other states, we will be after the surcharge expires, we still will be the fourth, um, the fourth highest. But you know, as I also mentioned, the tax rate, we can't just look at the tax rate in a vacuum in terms of competitiveness. I think there's a lot of other factors um, around infrastructure, transportation, educated workforce, higher education, K to 12. Like there's a lot of strengths, which is also why, you know, just a couple of facts on over the past couple of years, in 2022, New Jersey's um, GDP, GDP growth was actually um, 13th in the country. The job recovery, 111% of the pandemic job losses have been recovered, which is higher than all of our neighboring states. And New Jersey's per capita in personal income is higher than Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland, Delaware. So, you know, while we acknowledge the tax rate is high and clearly working to uh, working on that with the surcharge expiration, you know, the economy with the higher tax rate has still, we, you know, arguably have been a competitive state. So. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and also on that, that, whole that I would disagree with, but um, the critics are out there saying it. Audrey, it's Aaron talked about we're going to be in a better fiscal place now, but also if we start losing revenues, that could, could be troublesome. And, and can you talk about, you mentioned it, and um, other states that have these safeguards and, and what impacts, kind of downstream impacts that a CBT lower rate have, might have meant to other folks and, and other state revenues? Uh, thank you so much. And um um, this is this is a point that that I actually love to talk about. Um, to to set this up, so New Jersey has lost 47 billion of adjusted gross income um, in the past 30 years from income that has left our state. Um, what what our report has shown is that, and and I agree that this is one rate and it doesn't occur in a vacuum and it's not a silver bullet. Um, it's just something that is you know, top of mind right now and worth focusing on. Um, so eliminating the tax would grow um, personal income by roughly 30%. And that's important because in the way it, it, it offsets a loss. So um, that's an important additional business activity makes up the loss in corporate revenue. And I want to also point out that this, this corporate business tax is only 4 to 7% um, of, of the revenue in the state. Um, so, so again, just keeping this in perspective. And, and to answer your question, Chris, the impacts of CBT um, and the lowering of the CBT that have been demonstrated from you know, a decade's worth of data are that um, a high CBT directly correlates to a higher cost of goods and services. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, but lowering the CBT increases jobs. Um, it, is, it is shown over time that jobs are increased and that is both by corporations and again by the ancillary businesses that I mentioned earlier. Lowering CBT also increases salaries. Um, when they have less of a tax to pay, there is more money in the, corp in, in the corporate pot, if you will, and salaries have shown to go higher. Um, there's a higher return on investment, as in for the share shareholders of the company, and I don't want that to come across as just you know, your C-suite executives that are sitting in a boardroom collecting more money. Really, that is an investment to shareholders and pensions. Um, so it really does affect um, almost everyone. Um, and then finally, and I've mentioned it before, you know, businesses thrive and more businesses in Indiana, um, in Indiana and North Carolina, this was tracked. As the CBT went down, more businesses as a total or as a whole went up over the 10 years. Um, so those are some of the benefits that you see off the bat, and it allows the economy to, to get the boost, um, you know, to, to really fuel itself as opposed to um, needing to pay with tax, uh, play with the tax rate. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of, I think Aaron and Audrey both raised good points that we know that taxes aren't a silver bullet. We know that companies are not making decisions solely based on taxes. But we know that talking to some corporate BIA members that um, when they're talking about relocation and expansion, the head of tax is putting together a report to say what the tax climate is in this state versus that state. It's, it's a, a factor. Um, and so 
but there's so many positive things about New Jersey, it's not the only factor. If it was the only factor, we'd be probably be in some trouble in New Jersey. Um, but um, I think David and Michael probably have interesting perspectives because Stevens and Lee, Ernst and Young, they're not just a New Jersey firm, obviously. They, they're, they have clients all over the nation. Um, can you talk about some of the, whether it's the rate or some of the other features, because BIA's policy has always been, we just want balance. We don't want to be an outlier in taxes. We don't want to be an outlier because we want to be able to take advantage of all those great assets we have, and if we're an outlier in certain things, it's going to hurt us. Can you talk about your experiences and your firm's experiences and clients in other states, and maybe are there things that we're doing better, are there things that we're doing worse, and, and some of that um, multi-state perspective that your firms might have? Yeah, I mean, I think what you say is accurate. Um, it really is a business climate perception. I, I think that's important to a lot of business leaders. In, in other words, it's, you know, don't go to state X because they just don't treat corporations well. Whether or not going to state X is going to increase your tax or not in that state isn't as important as, you know, we just don't think it's a good state for doing business. And you see a lot of the groups come out with the uh, sort of tax climate uh, assessments in the state, which take a number of variables. And I mean, I think maybe looking towards this bill, there's a couple things that um, actually, you know, remove some of the, what I'll call thorns in the sides of corporate taxpayers. Um, you know, one of those is the ordering of dividends and net operating losses. And this was a situation where if you had a company that provided you a dividend, you had to deduct that before you took your net operating loss deduction. So, I'm sorry, you had to take your net operating loss deduction before you took the dividends received deduction. So dividends from a subsidiary would eat up your NOLs even though they're not taxable in the state. And so that was something that was changed in 18, changed back subsequently, and now we're getting that correct. I mean, did you want to, there's, yeah. some, there's some other provisions in here which I think are also taking us out of the outlier uh, category. Sure, uh, you know, as, as Dave had mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's the perception of the difficulty of tax administration in New Jersey that I think drives a lot of the, um, you know, the, the unwarranted negative attention. Um, you know, New, New Jersey has a very old corporation business tax law. It has a fairly old uh, personal income tax law. And they, when they were structured, they were structured rather uniquely. Um, you know, the, the gross income tax was meant for property tax relief. It wasn't tied to the Internal Revenue Code. It's, uh, you know, it creates winners and losers. Uh, you know, and it's difficult to administer. I, I think one of the things that people, uh, you know, always surprise me about when I speak to them across the country, you know, when I speak to my colleagues in other offices, is nobody understands partnership <laughs> compliance in New Jersey. Nobody, anywhere. Um, and you can make a career of simply trying to navigate that. And the reason for that is that when the, uh, when the partnership withholding rules were passed in 2002, they were embedded in the Corporation Business Tax Act, but this is withholding of income that's um, calculated under the Gross Income Tax Act. It makes no sense. Uh, before, there was uniformity because they were fairly similar, but as the laws under the Corporation Business Tax Act started to diverge, it, it really started going far afield. And now you have systematic over and under withholding, you have an entire uh, encyclopedia of forms that you need to submit to the division of taxation, you know, and, and the division really does its best, right? It really does its best trying to simplify very complex laws. So what, when you look at this act, it's actually a good first step to clearing that up and making tax administration more, uh, more coherent, right? And that's uh, changing the sourcing method of income under the gross income tax for, uh, for partnerships, for S corporations to to conform it to the corporation business tax act. Right, right. So f currently, you know, under the gross income tax for businesses that are partnerships or sole proprietorships, you're being your income to New Jersey is apportioned based on three factors: your property, your payroll, and your sales. For corporate tax purposes, it's just on your sales, and it, the state moved to that for business development purposes. You don't want to penalize people for basing your business in New Jersey, so. That penalty was removed at the corporation business tax level, but still exists for partnerships and sole proprietorships because 
Your payroll, if you're based in New Jersey, you have a high payroll factor. Your property, if you're based in New Jersey, you have a high property factor. And so, you know, even though it's not there for the CBT, it's still there under the gross income tax for the partnerships, for the sole proprietorships, the small businesses are being penalized for being located in New Jersey. And I think that's something, again, you could, we can move towards that and be consistent between the taxes so all businesses are getting treated equally in how they apportion their income to the state. Yeah, and, and just one thing, you know, going back to the division of taxation, I know that nobody anywhere likes the tax man, but I think that the division under current management has really done quite a lot to reach out to taxpayers. I think John Ficar is, you know, just fantastic in terms of, you know, being uh, public facing, really being concerned about the needs of taxpayers. Um, you know, when, when I talk to people in other states, you know, some of their tax departments just don't want to deal with taxpayers. They put out rules, those are the rules, you know, and leave them alone, they'll administer them as they see fit. I think the division, to its credit, really has made a concerted effort to talk to taxpayers, to try and reach reasonable resolutions in instances where the rules may not make sense as applied to particular taxpayers. Now that said, you, you know, it, it's something where additional outreach is definitely warranted you know, handing it back to Dave, there's going to be a lot of power being given to the director as part of this bill. And, you know, I think the taxpayer community does certainly have some thoughts about that. Yeah. So w one of the things I think Aaron mentioned, you know, this isn't a perfect bill. And I think the division has indicated that, yes, you know, if and when this gets passed, there's going to be regulations put out that will clarify and make sure it's what everyone intended on. I mean, the one provision, you know, if I have a soapbox for about 20 seconds here, <laughs> the one provision that I you see do. is problematic um, in the bill is there's a grant of discretion to the director for determining the makeup of a combined group. Now, the combined group is something that's dictated by statute, dictated by extensive regulations, dictated by constitutional law, our fear is this language really changes the you determine it under statutes and regulations with regard to constitutional law to the combined group becomes whatever the division thinks it should be and they put a standard to appeal that which essentially says and no matter what we're still right. And so you know, we've talked to people in the division they said David don't worry we're not going to go that far we know that. And, I like these people, I trust these people, but I'm thinking what happens 10 years from now when there's different people in those seats. And so that's one of the provisions where I don't think the language quite reflects what we want. I mean, I think everyone agrees the division can go out, they can audit the composition of the group and apply those constitutional principles, those statutes and those regulations to, to see if it's determined properly. But you know, in that instance, that's one thing that you know, we've gotten feedback from a lot of taxpayers that this makes the system arbitrary and hard to predict for corporate taxpayers. Um, and so thank you very much. Uh, you go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, just one, uh, one thing to add to that too, um, not to that specific provision, which I know will be a topic of discussion for a while, but the, um, just so the division of taxation, I think it's important to recognize them and uh, the fact that the, this bill and a lot of the outcome of this really is a result of their proactive approach. Like they, they really are take a different approach, I think, than the generally, you know, what people perceive of a division of taxation would, would do. And they reached out and they really sort of organized this working group and with a with a lot of different goals, but really to reach consensus and achieve the goals on, on both sides for the business community as well as, you know, the tax compliance administration side. So you know, this bill really is a, a successful model, I think, in just their approach to... Yeah, I mean, de definite shout out to, uh, you know, uh, Council Klein at the division and Andrew Staltari who's in the council's office who did a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, you know, Alan Klein, you know, is an amazing person. When we've had those discussions, whether we got the result we wanted or not, we felt heard, listened to, and understood. And, you know, I think that, that's, that goes a very long way. You know, we know in state government that's not always the case, and as lobbyists, <laughs> that's not always the case. But with Treasury taxation, and I know Treasury talked earlier about the staff she inherited and, and being fantastic, and obviously a lot of taxation is that, but also folks like you, Aaron, um, Kathy Brennan, Jennifer Keys Maloney, other folks that she's hired that have been great to work with. So um, it is very um, telling that her leadership and then the folks that have been there a long time, it's just a great group. And so. Thank you to um, everyone there, especially uh, Alan's gotten a lot of shout outs, but he's been fantastic to work with there. And, and, um, and yeah, that's why the discretion language, I know a lot of times when the discretion is being used, it's actually being used a lot of times to help the taxpayer, um, just as much as sometimes taxpayers don't love it. Um, and, but there is that, that what if that some taxpayers are rightly concerned about, um, but 
but overall, like there, there, as we've heard about, there's so much good in this bill. Um, I think it, it outweighs that what if component in that discretionary language. And, um, but it'll certainly be something that comes up as we continue to move forward and hopefully get this bill done this spring. Um, want to turn it back to um, Audrey and talking about that rate. And um, it came up earlier that it was 2,500 companies. Um, and some people have put out there that, oh, this is only this number. Can you talk about like those 2,500 corporations that are paying that 11.5 percent? Can you talk about how much of an economic footprint they have in the state? I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you know, I've looked into this a fair amount. Those 2,500 um, corporations account for over a million jobs in the state, um, and that's no small number. Uh, it's 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 really worth considering. Um, I. You know, off the top of my head, there's something else I, I wanted to mention. And, and listen, anecdotally, I've talked about, you know, how this rate affects so many people. That's that's a million people in this state that are, um, you know, could get a higher salary. Um, it, and, and a couple of other things I want to point out. Um, if we were to follow the course of North Carolina, we would actually have 750,000 more jobs here. Um, you know, over the course of it's a 10 years worth of data. Um, so exponentially, you know, this, this impacts so many people. Um, and two other points I wanted to bring up, you know, since I have the microphone. <laughs> um, in in 20, um, tw if 2006, we had 22 Fortune 500 companies. Um, and today we have 15. So at this rate, we're in trouble for the number of jobs in the state. And, and I just, you know, I, I want to reinforce that. And then the other one, um, you know, worth considering is, um, is that number that New Jersey has lost 350 to 400 billion in personal income. Um, that's money that could be working in the state, um, you know, through these, through these jobs and through these million people. It's, you know, when, when money is back and being reinvested in the communities, it matters to everyone, to the mom and pop shops, you know, to, to the people on Main Street, um, you know, all the way up to the C-suite level. So, so that's something we've really thought about is, is those million jobs. Thank you. And do want to draw everybody's attention. It's <laughs> on your tables. Um, there was a one-page graphic that Garden State Initiative and BA put out together to defend the position of the Murphy administration that this tax should be sunset and kind of setting fact versus fiction. So um, would uh, yeah look at that sunset and uh, and remember the good things that are going on here, um, Chris. Just, yeah. Can I just jump in with one one just small counterpoint? Um, the <laughs> that that's all right. We like counterpoints. <laughs> uh, we will not turn this into a debate. I promise. But uh, the 2018 before the surcharge went into effect, the CBT revenue collected by the state was 2.3 billion dollars. In 2023, I believe. The revenue is will be over five billion dollars. So the, the actual corporate, just in terms of sort of stifling growth, and you know, and we, you know, certainly, I mean, this is not to say we don't agree the surcharge will expire and needs to expire, but you know, the economic activity and the growth has, you know, that arguably based on the actual tax collection, which is based on um, the profits, like has not been stifled. No, but point well taken. Um, on that, Do I, I get to jump in, or? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Audrey. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not going to be a debate. <laughs> um, you know, all I can say is looking at the 10 years of data that we have for North Carolina, Iowa, Indiana, you know, well, maybe we're not losing money. Maybe we could be gaining more. Um, I, last thing I'll say on this, then. <laughs> we looked at North Carolina. We looked at the report. The, they started reducing the revenue, or the, sorry, the tax rate in 2013. Correct. 2009 was when the trend actually started with their economic growth. So I would argue that it's not necessarily a correlation there, but I do, that's the last thing I'm gonna say. <laughs> I'll let you have the last word. We're gonna agree to disagree. It was starting to plateau. I know that chart. <laughs> No, and this is why tax policy is interesting, and this is why we can we can debate things like this for a long time. But um, uh, I also am that that two and a half to five figure, Aaron, I'm fascinated by that because yeah, some component of the two and a half percent surtax is part of that. Some component of corporate growth nationally, internationally, at the time is part of that. 
Um, obviously, the pandemic has been interesting, where we thought it would, would hurt revenues in many ways, and, and it's done the opposite in some. But then how much of that is the TCJA changes and the fact that there's been a broadening of, of that, that CBT base that, that's come from federal change that we had nothing to do with. So I, I don't know if anybody knows. I don't know if Treasury knows exactly. I've tried to actually parse out how much is this, how much is that. But that growth has been startling because CBT used to be a much smaller part of our state budget than it's become. Um, and I guess with that question, thinking about just um, future, um, we, we know, we've talked about the bill, Michael and David have gone into it, and that it's um, revenue neutral, and I know taxation, treasury are, are um, trying to get information um, to the legislature, because I've heard a lot of legislators, it's funny, for some legislators say, well, Chris, we don't trust this is revenue neutral, we think taxation is trying to rip your, you guys off, and then some saying, we don't trust this revenue neutral, they're trying to give you too big of a tax cut, and I was like, I think it's revenue neutral, the only people that you can really trust to be revenue neutral is is taxation, they're the ones that actually see the returns. But, um, but can Aaron, you talk, and maybe um, Mike and, and, and David, the, the aspect of revenue neutral, but then also the future of, of taxation. Do we, does Treasury do long-term planning and kind of look where, where CBT is going from here? Because I've heard it's one of the hardest things to predict, um, and, and obviously parsing out what's happened in the past, but going forward because of these changes, but also because of just the, the corporate tax climate that that's, uh, we're seeing. Uh, what do you see going forward? Yeah, I mean, historically, it's been just an incredibly hard tax to predict, to project out. I mean, we've really been, you know, if you look at the last 20 years of um, revenue forecasting, it, we have not been very successful, I think, in really tracking it very well. Um, it, you know, this bill in particular, we're going through it carefully. It's a complicated bill, as, as we all know here, um, to, to really try to make sure we're, uh, you know, as accurate as we can be in the revenue estimate. Uh, definitely confident. I mean, I think just the way the, the bill was negotiated and the consensus that was reached, we're confident it's revenue neutral. But, you know, it's to actually get to those final numbers, it's, you know, just taking a little bit of time. And we definitely are hearing the same things you're hearing from the legislature around, you know, being reassured that it's revenue neutral. So um, in terms of future tax planning, you know, I mean, I think we're really focused on just getting through um, this bill for now. <laughs> Uh, we know we've already, uh, just from talking to John Ficarra yesterday, like there's a, they have other things they'd like to get done. I know the business community and probably people at this table have other things they'd like to get done. So, you know, I, I, there'll be opportunity. I mean, the division really has sought out, you know, as much input as they can. They've sought out these discussions to see what concerns are out there, and they'll continue doing that. Yeah, I, and I think, you know, I, I encountered the revenue issue back in 2002, which was, Prior to 2018, the biggest corporate tax changes New Jersey had put through, and they put a study commission in after they passed the legislation, and we were trying to get projections and numbers, and it's next to impossible. You're, you're really just making a lot of educated guesses. Um, you know, looking, talking to clients, talking to companies, um, you know, everyone said, I think what, what Chris said here, it's a mixed bag, you know, and so, you know, sort of anecdotally, you know, everyone's saying, yeah, there's, there's a give and take here from most of the companies in business saying, yeah, we think we're going to be better. We're going to be less annoyed because it's clearing up and making New Jersey consistent with the surrounding states. Um, you know, as for future, I mean, I think the couple things I mentioned, you know, Aaron, if you guys do have a, a list, you know, look at, you know, see the gross income tax rates, you know, potentially cap the tax rate on flow through in entities at 9% for gross income tax. So it's equal to the corporate rate. Look at the apportionment for gross income tax. You know, and this, this is something that was very much directed to large corporations. Maybe the next step is to encourage small business by making the gross income tax on small business similar to the, the corporate taxes. Yeah, and following up on Dave's comments, um, you know, even though in the aggregate this is intended to be revenue neutral, there's still going to be winners and losers here, right? There's, there's no way to prevent that. You know, I, I think that there really was a concerted effort to make it as broad-based a benefit as possible. But there are certain aspects to this where, where some taxpayers are, are, are going to be left out in the cold, you know, the expansion of nexus and, um, you know, the scheduling out of certain deferred tax deductions, things of that nature. Um, you know, as to the future, you know, in addition to the GIT, which I, I think is of, of paramount importance in the state just given its prominence as a revenue raiser, um, it is also certain aspects of the Corporation Business Tax Act 
that you know could be uh, smooth to make it less um, less you know disadvantageous to actually uh, domicile in New Jersey. So any any aspects where somebody who's a New Jersey domiciliary pays more tax than somebody who's not, those should also be considered. Thank you. Sure. Um, with that, I wanted to turn over to you guys. Um, we have four tax and fiscal experts up here who would be happy to answer uh, some questions from the audience. And um, I hope there's some, uh, we actually got into the weeds on some corporate tax issues, probably more so than other people are used to hearing about. But it's an important issue, especially in this year's budget. Um, so any questions from the audience? Yes, go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Mike. <coughs> I just want to acknowledge you and the esteemed panel, you know, of the work that we've behind the scenes with our joint tax committee and everything. David, Mike, Audrey, with you and Regina, the work that you do, Aaron, you with the treasurer. Uh, this, this has been uh, a yeoman's task. And I guess trying to uh, probably attribute it to somebody in the legislature, it might have been Bob Smith, who said, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And we know, to, I, I think the theme that we ended on is, it's not a perfect bill. But where we got, and kudos to all of you and some of the other uh, individuals in our collective uh, tax group working on it. And look, it doesn't preclude from any known entities. We know how the process works. I look at you, Aaron, you worked in the legislature, and you, you as well, Chris, that we've told other businesses that they're not, you know, completely happy with it. The process is there. They can still, you know, work the process in the next couple of weeks. Hopefully we'll get the budget done early, you know, as opposed to, <laughs> to at the end of June. But I just wanted to, you know, leave it at that, that, you know, kudos to all of you in the work, but the process is still open and, you know, legislators are still going to take valuable input. And I don't think we've ever seen a legislative initiative been around with you, Aaron, you know, in the halls for many years. If we have to go back, I know Paul Sarlo doesn't like calling them cleanup bills, but <laughs> if we have to go back and tweak things down the road and, and such, that's the way the process is. But more or less, thank you to all of you and, and the work that you did. And as I said, I give a lot of kudos uh, to Chris, uh, you know, managing all the different uh, interests that were in our collective uh, tax group. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for the question. Chris, just one other thing to add to that, too. I, thanks, Mike. I, you know, I think it's also important that we recognize Senator Sarlo and it's something when Pinter Marin, who sort of jumped out and are taking the lead with this bill, a complicated bill, and, you know, they are going to run with it. And, you know, so a, a shout out to them as well. You know, two, uh, to Aaron's point, the two budget chairs, uh, Chairwoman Pinto Moran in the Assembly and uh, Senator Sarlo of the Senate Budget and Appropriations Committee have, have been leaders on a lot of pro-business, uh, pro-taxpayer initiatives over the years and deserve a lot of credit for um, sometimes the, they're, they're, they're have, whether it's stood up to the Murphy administration, I'm sure they're not always on the same page with you guys, stood up to their caucus, stood up to Republicans. They've done a lot to um, push for business initiatives and taxpayer initiatives over the years. Um, business side or just even just a personal residential side. So um, they deserve a lot of credit and um, and uh, on this bill jumping in and, and supporting a uh, Murphy administration initiative, treasury initiative, um, something the BIA, the chamber are happy to support. And then the two budget chairs, um, hopefully that's a good sign that this bill can, can move. Um, do we have a question from one of the more important people in the room? <laughs> how will the companies learn how to follow the new law? We'll that's help. Excellent question. <laughs> call, call Mike. <laughs> Great question. Dave's also pretty good. So. That, no, that, Nathan, that's a fantastic question. Um, that's, I would say, number one, we'll actually hear about it a little bit later on the small business side, but Treasury does a nice job promoting everything and putting out bulletins and notices and working with taxpayers. And then I know we have two fantastic firms here on the accounting side and tax attorney side that... Um, do a lot of great work for companies up and down New Jersey. And, um, and you have two experts here, but you have also other experts in the room probably. And, and after this panel, we're going to break and have a little bit of networking and maybe have some of those experts chance to talk to each other. Um, but but that's, that's their job. And so I would encourage you, um, these, are, these are fantastic firms and super smart guys to talk to. And then it's part of BIA's job. And so we'll be communicating to our members um, when this law goes into effect and the changes that it might have. And, um, and hopefully that'll be sooner rather than later, but, but that's our job to make sure you know tax policy, energy policy, environment policy, labor policy, health policy, education policy, 
And so um, we're always there to serve our members. And so please reach out if you have any questions and um, we can help you with, or we could also hook you up with some of our other good members in that accounting um, tax attorney world. But excellent question. Uh, Ray? Hi. Um, can you hear me? This, this is all yes. I am not a tax expert, so I'm, I'm not going to ask a tax question. You know, I, I couldn't do that if I wanted to. Um, but I will make an economic growth uh, statement, and you know, you can respond to that. Um, I, I do know that since, and, and obviously the answer is going to be multifaceted. It's not going to be all tax or anything else. But I do know from a manufacturing perspective that since 1990. We have lost 279,000 manufacturing jobs in New Jersey, well over half of our jobs you know, at that point in time. We're down to, I believe, about 250 uh, right now. I also know, anecdotally, I had a colleague, or have a colleague, who just came back from North Carolina, um, where she was talking to their environmental officials, who told me that they cannot keep up with all the permits that they need to do, because of all the manufacturers who are flooding into that state. So it may not be taxed, but obviously something is going on that, that makes North Carolina a more competitive um, environment, at least for the manufacturing um, uh, aspect of it. Thank you, Ray. Anybody want to comment on that? I, I could jump in just to say, you know, anecdotally, and some of the um, information is obviously there's a cost of living um, issue that is you know, obvious um, when you compare the two states. Um, and down the road, there um, there's some indication that, you know, red tape has been a bit of an issue in this state and that there could be room for improvement. <laughs> I, I see some nodding in the audience. But but as, as I said earlier, you know, CBT rate is not a silver bullet that these other states that were mentioned um, put forth a multifaceted effort in order to grow industry and um, attract businesses. And it's not going to happen with a single rate. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have a direct response to just because I don't have all the data in front of me, but I do know that um, you know the EDA has put forward some programs, a lot of programs, more targeted economic um, incentive kind of programs um, to target manufacturing as well as other industries. I also know that the one thing I do remember in really rough numbers, you know, and this isn't a direct response to your question or the statement either, but New Jersey's um, per capita income is somewhere in the mid $70,000 range. North Carolina's is significantly lower. I think it's in the low 50s. So, you know, just as one indicator of, of New Jersey's economy, I think that would, you know, but I, I don't have a great response in terms of the manufacturing specifically for you. No, thank you. Uh, manufacturing, near and dear to BIA's heart. We started over 110 years ago as, as New Jersey Manufacturers Association, and um, and manufacturing is still very strong in this state, but but not as strong as I think we'd all like to. And thank, thank you to the governor and the legislature for, in the Economic Recovery Act of 2020, as you referenced the EDA programs, um, manufacturing is, is one of the target areas there. Um, the EDA and got funding last year's budget and funding again in this year's budget for their very successful MVP program which is kind of helping manufacturers support some of their capital needs. So there's, there's work going on, but, um, but yeah, Ray and myself and BIA would say, hey, we can't do enough to help manufacturers because the, the multiplier effect of those on the economy. And also, I've, we're up here on a corporate tax panel. Manufacturers are disproportionately registered as corporations, um, unlike a lot of other um, parts of the economy that are moving to be more passed through these days. And so um, a lot of that is manufacturers are older and back way back in the day, everybody was a C Corp and, and it's, it's changed today. But um, so anything we're doing on CBT bill and CBT rate, I think is going to help manufacturers more. So hopefully it'll start the, uh, the work that Ray referenced that's important. Any other questions? Okay. Um, yes, go ahead. What's the plan going forward? I mean, this is this tax with this tax refund was mandated. I want to know what the next steps are to continually lower the tax rate on the CBT on the corporate side. I'm a small business and you eat alive my income. And therefore, there is no money to make the raises that need to be given to the people who work hard. And those per capita numbers have to be there because people can't afford to live here in New Jersey, which makes it harder for me 
every day to employ people who need to be in my company to help grow it. So I want to know, this is a small step, very small step. I want to know what's next. I, yeah, I mean, the one thing I would say, like in the same way, you know, the, the financial problems facing the state of New Jersey, you know, we're not going to fix them in a, in a year in one budget. You know, we're facing a hundred billion dollar unfunded pension liability, significant post-retirement medical liabilities, um, significant general obligation debt liability, and we're not going to fix the CBT or the tax issues in one year as well. So this is the incremental step that the governor has stands behind, is committed to, um, to letting the surcharge expire. This other bill is going to have to provide some benefit. Um, you know, I, th I know the next panel is going to talk about some other things with small business. I know the PT bait has been extremely successful, wildly successful program, more so than we ever anticipated, which has been a great workaround for um, shielding some federal tax liability. Um, and uh, it's been, t you know, taken advantage of much more than we ever anticipated. So, so yeah. And, and I, I think, you know, the, the real answer to your question is Chris needs a job. So, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I, I, think, I think, you know, every time we see tax changes come through, you know, as Aaron sort of referred to, we, we all go back afterwards and we've got our notepads and we say, we, we ask that question is what next? I mean, you said taxation has a number of things. I think from an economic perspective, I think, you know, the treasurer has a number of ideas of how to do this. I think from a, you know, chamber and BIA perspective, you know, uh, Mike and Chris have ideas of what we want to do. And, you know, it, it's it, it ultimately the answer is it's the process. This is one round. Um, you know, maybe get us through this round, and then we pick up and and, and with, with a new list. Yeah, no, to, I mean to your question. In the future, you will see um, this summer, this fall, once this budget gets struck. Um, I, I don't think we want to um, put the cart before the horse. And there are um, legislators, there are other entities in the state of New Jersey that don't agree that this CBT reform bill and this expiration of the surtax is a good thing. So we need to. Be vigilant with that and not take it for granted it's going to happen, even though proposed by the governor sounds like it's it's going in the right direction. And I think I feel good about it happening this June. Um, but, but kind of focusing on that, but in the future, BIA plans to work. And I know we're already talking to Garden State Initiative about um, what is next and kind of uh, economic roadmap um, to uh, some of the things that were addressed up here. Some of the things will probably be addressed at the next one. Um, and looking at kind of a, a, a comprehensive plan to bring that balance to New Jersey. Um, but also thinking about, as Aaron said, there, there's fiscal realities, and, um, and I think Audrey laid it out very well that most of the states that have looked at this have done it with guardrails, have done it by step by step by step. It's not an all at once. No one's saying we should go from 11 and a half to zero, 11 and a half to five. I think 11 and a half to nine is a pretty good, it's, it's smaller than we'd all like, but it's pretty good for a step. Um, two and a half percentage points. Yeah, it's going back to where we started, so should we take credit for that? But there's, there, there's folks that thought that we weren't going to go back to where we started, and that 11 and a half would become permanent. Um, so, so I like to say thank you for the things that um, weren't a given, and, um, and I don't think it was ever a given, and so I think the governor does have credit for proposing that. Um, but, more, but, but we need more work. You are right. Um, it's a first step. So you'll be hearing in the summer, in the fall, and also, we have um, elections this November. Every one of the 120 legislators are up, so I'm sure there'll be um, candidates on both sides of the aisle talking about what they see in the economy. And, um, and so I'm sure this fall um, we'll be in touch. And if I could jump in with a positive note um, in sharing the report with legislators on both sides of the aisle, there seems to be um, an appreciation for this and an acknowledgement and even support for next steps. So to Chris's point, what we're hearing is let's get through this um, and then please come back with more information. So that's a really positive note. Yeah, no, I think we have time for one last question from Ralph Thomas, but also please reach out to us because if you have good ideas, you're an employer, um, you pay taxes and we want to represent our members. So if you have ideas, hey Chris, it'd be great if they do this, this, like stay in touch because I want to hear from you because you have insight that I'm not going to have and, and I want to learn from you. Thank you. Uh, Ralph? Uh, Chris, one thing that uh, we've been disappointed in is, is the fact that the, the governor it, it, uh, indicated that he was going to right-size state government, and that hasn't happened. 
And um, I think that combined with the, the lack of technology in, the, uh, in state government, this has been a big problem for organizations like mine and for licensing and whatnot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What's going to be done about that? I've asked this question a number of times at different meetings, and people say, yeah, yeah, we're, yeah we have this, uh, but nothing, get, nothing seems to be getting done. That's a tricky one. Aaron, do you want to comment yeah, on that I, first? I, could you, I'm, I didn't entirely understand. When you say right-sizing, are, are you saying make government smaller? Yeah. Okay, because the, the state workforce, I don't have the chart in front of me, but the state workforce is down thousands of employees. The, the government is much smaller today, the state government, than when Governor Murphy start, took over. But also the uh, lack of technology uh, is, is a problem as well. So for example, uh, with the Division of Consumer Affairs, in terms of licensing it, I, I had a, situ a situation where my members, uh, CPAs, were having challenges getting licenses uh, from the division. So, you, so I certainly agree that state, technology in the state is incredibly antiquated, like in, across the board. However, there are significant investments being made. I mean, it's the kind of thing where you would, it's just too much. Like, there is too much to tackle in one at once. But there's investments being made in MVC system. Um, taxation has a, a massive new system that's going to benefit everyone. Portal, it's quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be, it's a, it's a several year project, but it is going to be incredibly beneficial to the business community and taxpayers. Um, there's a lot of other systems. I could, we can get you a list. Actually, there is massive investments. <laughs> and now, uh, Ralph, you pointed out the poster child of Division of Consumer Affairs because we do have a workforce crisis of sorts in, in many industries throughout the state. And um, Althea is doing a fantastic job at BIA, um, shepherding a bill that came out of the Assembly Majority Office um, to address that issue and try to get more funding to the Division of Consumer Affairs. And um, so. We know if there's a workforce crisis, we shouldn't have state government lack of certifications or licenses getting in the way of that. So hopefully that bill moves forward um, this spring and, and gets done, and I think that'll help there. But, but yeah, the, the, we, we've heard in a lot of budget, um, talking budget and taxes here, a lot of these budget hearings have talked about, like DEP spent a lot of time talking about the lack of staff there. And, and so it's, it's, we, we want state government to be right-sized, and I think technology, you're 100% right, is a big part of that. But I also think um, sometimes it's a double-edged sword that um, you have less people that are actually there to answer the questions. Like, we, we've said great things about taxation, but sometimes at labor or DEP, they're not getting that same customer service. So it, it's, um, um, there's, there's definitely work to be done, and you're 100% right, but I think there's also some, some areas where uh, they probably need more staff. And that, that's why I asked the question what right-sizing means to you, because because I think we have gotten a lot of, there are issues where we can't, we haven't been able to, have enough staff in yeah. some areas, so. And, and specifically in the Division of Consumer Affairs, where, uh, you know, um, the, that, well, as we budget that, we've had several meetings about that in terms of the lack of uh, technology there, the fact that uh, money gets diverted or moved over or shifted over from that, from that organization to other organizations. And this has just been a real issue uh, in the business community. And particularly for you know my members in terms of them being able to get licenses and things of that nature, or even being able to get to people in the division of consumer affairs, it's like a train wreck. No, you're 100 percent right there, and that's something that I think is a bipartisan initiative to focus on that. And I also think that this is a whole other conversation, and, and I know past BIA events have talked about this: the issue of remote work. And I know um, legislative leadership, both Senate President Scutari, Speaker Coughlin, have talked about. Um, what impact is that having on the ability of state government to be responsive? And again, I haven't noticed it in Treasury, and I think we're dealing with one of the more responsive, um, customer-friendly parts of state government, but I know there's some entities in state government that are less so, and, um, and people are frustrated. I hear from both sides of the legislature, and, and I hear from BIA members. So um, we're getting there. Consumer affairs is definitely an important one that we're prioritizing. Okay. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much to our esteemed panelists. Um, and so now we have a 10-minute uh, break, stretch your legs, get some fruit, coffee, um, take a bio break, and then we'll be back to talk about small business tax issues in a few minutes. Thank you.